Welcome back, Chappelle. Welcome back, Honors. That's right. Welcome back to your, like, commonly shared flip. Um, expect these a little bit more often now. Expect for, like, most of the time for us to be sharing uh, some common flips due to the fact that we're in the last home stretch of the year. We only have, I was looking at the, the whole shebang, you know, we only have, like, five weeks of school left, including exams, which is wild. Um, so we're going to share this flip, even though we're kind of at different parts, right? So the honors class, y'all already gone over this stuff, and we also went over this in B and C period, but I wanted to go over it again just to make sure that you completely comprehended it and that you understood. And then listen closely to instructions, because some of these things are only going to apply to academic, some of them are only going to apply to honors. For example, honors, remember, y'all are reading the first chapter of our book, All Quiet on the Western Front, the novel that we are reading in conjunction with World War I, and the message board assignments and stuff like that we will be explaining in class. And then academic, there's an announcement in this flip that you need to pay attention for, okay? So <clears throat> at one point towards the end of the flip, I will tell the academic classes that you can stop and that you can like wait till the class for us to tell the last kind of stories and stuff, whereas the honors kids, y'all will keep going, okay? So anyway, let's go ahead and get uh, started off with it. We were talking about in class the main causes of World War I, right? Military, mil militarism. Militarism, alliances, imperialism, nationalism. And we began by talking about... <coughs> excuse me. We began by talking about the original alliance that was set up by Otto von Bismarck, known as the Th League of Three Emperors, right? And this original alliance set up by Bismarck is going to be used to try and keep France isolated and prevent them from having any strong allies that they will be able to unite with and form a large base alliance to then go to war and yank Germany into it, right? Germany is a fledgling country. They are brand new to the streets. They have only been there since 1871. So Bismarck was not about to allow a large-scale war following the embarrassing defeat of France during the Franco-Prussian War, right? So he's going to create this League of Three Emperors. However, it's going to be very unstable, right? So he had to constantly try to keep it together due to a lot of different factors, including some stuff that we talked about in my AP class with the Russo-Turkish War and like some stuff like that. But the thing you need to understand is that Russians and Eastern Europeans, not all of them, but predominantly are what you would refer to as Slavic, right? And Russia has a support of Slavic people. They want Balkan countries and Slavic people to have their own countries, their own governments, because it's like an element of ethnic nationalism, right? <clears throat> but then also, Austria controls a huge number of people in the Balkans and a huge number of these Slavic people. So there is some dissent between Russian and Austrians. They don't really like each other that much. However, this alliance is going to be used to prevent them from fighting and to also prevent one of them from being courted by the French, right? Now, Kaiser Wilhelm II is going to come into power, though. And he's the worst, and nobody likes him at all. And he decides to fire Bismarck, and he pushes Russia out of this alliance, and he chooses to ally with Austria-Hungary. Now, in this process, France is then going to sign an alliance with Russia, drawing brand new military lines. And this alliance is going to take place around the 1890s, about 1891. And so it's going to be a very, very older alliance. But during this process, when Russia left their alliance, it actually happened in the first period. There were two times that Russia left, and the first little gap they left, the Triple Alliance will be formed. And that's going to be between Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy. Now, Italy is a very important one that I need you to do me a favor really quick. Underline Italy and circle it and put a question mark next to them because it's very, very strange because at the beginning of the war, Italy is actually going to declare itself neutral, right? So very important that we understand that ironically enough, Italy might have been in this alliance, but they never actually fought in this war alongside of these other alliance members. So France and Germany are massive enemies, as we know, following their loss in the Franco-Prussian War. And to protect Germany, Kaiser Wilhelm is going to sign treaties with Austria and Italy, promising to protect them should a war break out. Now, they are going to earn themselves a nickname, or a other name, or a whatever you want to call it. And they are going to be called the Central Powers. Not to be confused with the Axis Powers, because that is a World War II term, right? So, now, but going forward, though, this Central Powers Coalition is going to be called this because they are literally in the center area of the map, and they are located centrally within Europe, because you have Germany, Austria, and Italy right there in the median level 
of the European continent, right? So there's another group that's going to come in and join them later on, but they're not going to join up until about October of 1914, right? Now, in a massive process of other crazy stuff going on, we're going to teach it a little bit differently, kind of out of order, but to give you a heads up looking down the pipe, then in opposition to the Central Powers, the Triple Entente is going to be formed. Now, I'm skipping over some stuff in history for anybody that's watching this video right now that's not in my class and you're like, this guy doesn't seem to know what he's talking about. Uh, I do know and I'm fully aware that the Entente Cordiale was formed, the Franco-Russian Alliance, and then also the Anglo-Russian like the Anglo -Russian Alliance then forming the Triple Entente. So calm down. I'm just trying to make sure everybody understands. Now look, the Triple Entente is going to be formed in conjunction and opposition to the Central Powers. Now what an Entente is, just so you know, it's an informal agreement between countries, right? So an entente is like an understanding or an agreement. Just like France had an entente with the English because they could see the Russian, or not Russian, the English and German uh, alliance deteriorating. We're going to talk about the specific event here in a little while that led to that deterioration. It has to do with boats, right? So the France... The France, for the French, the Russians, and the British are going to form that Triple Entente. Their nickname, they will also be known as the Allies, right? Just like they were in World War II. Now, this one's a little bit weird, okay? France is going to ally after the failure of the League of Three Emperors, right? Then France is going to ally with Great Britain after the Entente Cordiale, and then Britain is going to ally with Russia. This is why their group is known as the Triple Entente. Because they never actually formally came together and said the three of us are going to join forces just in case an oppositional war with Germany rises up. Instead, it was like, we all just happen to be in alliances with each other, so we all just happen to be in this weird little agreement, right? So the allies are going to be between these three particular countries. France, Great Britain, and Russia. Russia, this is their old imperial flag for any of you who are like, I thought it was red, white, and blue now. Um, it is now. Uh, however, it looks like the French flag is just turned. Now, this is the old imperial flag, the double-headed black eagle, though, of Russia, right? And as you can see, the Entente, it's like a handshake. It's like an agreement, right? Now, the Allies, though, is not going to be limited to just those groups, okay? You're eventually going to integrate Belgium, Serbia, and several other places as well, right? Japan actually is going to join alongside the Allies as well due to the fact that they actually are seeing some major gains for themselves. They believe that they will be able to continue their imperial conquesting, and actually also their modernization has led to them being able to actually wage wars on a Western scale, right? So the Triple Entente, as looking at this right here, is going to be made up of this periwinkle color of people. And as you can see, all these treaties were signed at different times. 1894 is going to be the one between Russia and France. They actually have a bridge to commemorate this. Um, then Russia and Fr Russia and Britain in 1907, France and Britain in 1904. Now, and as you can see, these are much earlier on, right? These are much earlier on when these were made, and the Ottoman Empire is going to join their alliance in 1914, right? And this all started over disputes over the Balkan territories, right? Particularly Bulgaria, Serbia, and Bosnia, right? And this right here is just a little map of everyone that's going to end up joining in. Because like I said, remember, Italy is a weird one. Italy is a weird one because they actually came in when they decided to enter the war in 1915. They actually entered on the side of the Allies because they were disgusted with the way that the Ru the Austrians were handling the Russian occupation, right? So now, really, really quick though, this is the other big thing. So we, had, we can see looking forward that alliances are going to be a major factor because when this war breaks out and when we get to this, when one of these groups decides that they're going to go off and fight one of these other groups, these alliance systems are going to crumble and if... Austria declares war on somebody, and Russia declares war on Austria, then Germany declares war on Russia, then France declares war on Germany, and it's just going to all go down kind of like a fight in a cafeteria, right? So it's all going to just kind of implode in on itself. Now, going forward, though, militarism is going to be another major reason why this war breaks out, right? And something to kind of keep in mind is what that is, where it's coming from, things like that. So down here, I actually have a definition of militarism. Militarism is the glorification of glory and building up of your military, right? It's the creating the military as the focal point of your society. Trying to create a system where most people in your society lean on or look to the military as a symbol of their national strength, right? Now to give you a heads up, some of these countries' militarism values are not equal or the same as others, right? 
Ironically enough, Russia had the largest military, but they were super undersupplied, right? Germany had the largest supplied military. France is going to deploy more troops than Germany, but it's a very weird kind of situation, right? So economic competition, though, is going to be a big reason why this thing, whole, like, the militarism thing flurries up, though, okay? Because all these different countries, Germany, not so much Austria. Austria kind of had priorities in different places. Germany, France, Great Britain being three big ones to actually consider, were constantly competing with each other for money arms they were trying to always have more weapons or more devices than the other one um and then also colonies right and countries are going to practice this militarism aspect to try and show off their strength now as you can see right here there's going to be a lot of the new technologies that are going to play into this war and that is a direct reflection of the fact that industrialism is the big thing that's changing right because this glorification of the military is not just a societal glorification it is now a post-industrial glorification right because the industrial revolution has now had so much time to breathe we are over a hundred years out of it by this point and now the industrial revolution is directly affecting military technology the growth of the military and the expansion of the military right for example we talked about this already in imperialism but i'm bringing it back up again this is an example of the industrial military complex right so the maxim gun and its creation in 1884 by an english inventor known as known as Hiram Maxim, and here he is standing with his device, right? Look at him, look at him, look at that little old beard. And this gun right here, the Hiram Maxim gun, or the Maxim gun, is a fully automatic machine gun. Now, don't let Mr. Wooderson lie to you, okay? He claims the Gatling gun is the first machine gun. I think he's not right, all right? So anyway, now, now the later models could fire six so yeah, so the earliest models that Maxim and Bennett can fire about 200 rounds per minute, right? And then after their full production scale actually kicks up, some of the later models prove that they can fire 600 rounds per minute. However, this number is going to be diluted a little bit because there were some drawbacks, right? It's heavy, it jams, it has to have a water jacket on it. So like, for example, you see this little, like that's the barrel that the bullets come out of, and this little sleeve that's on the outside is not a silencer for any of you who like video games and stuff like that. It's actually a water jacket to keep keep the barrel from warping under massive like cause of heat right but the maxim gun is a good example because literally it's like a moving factory for bullets right in a way okay and what i mean by that is you hold that trigger down and it will continue to fire bullets as long as it does not jam or as long as the water does not deplete and the the barrel actually warps right so this is not a, this war is going to be the very first time this gun is ever going to be used right and all these different countries had access to their own models of this type of gun. The very first one was actually invented in Great Britain and made by the Vickers Company, right? Now, some people are, the later models are going to be called the Vickers gun, right? Now, the Industrial Revolution is going to change warfare as the world knew it, right? Because look at all these things. You now have locomotives that are going to bring supplies to the front lines faster than they ever have before. So military lines, reinforcements, weaponry, and supplies are going to be coming to the front very, very quickly. And whoever has the most railroads can fight this war more efficiently, which is going to be a big reason why Russia actually fights this war inefficiently later on during the World War actually itself because of their limited lack of major railways going into wartime areas, right? The telegraph is going to be an insane thing. Telegraph machine invented by Samuel Morse, right? The guy who also invented this Morse code is going to actually be used to carry messages much, much faster. In the late 1800s, the very, very first transatlantic telegraph wire was actually laid going from the United States all the way to Great Britain. You can now send messages over hundreds of miles in an instant, right? And you actually use this device to go dee, 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 and then you had a person on the other end that actually transcoded it and actually deciphered it and sent the message forward. And then, of course, we also have steam-powered vessels. So this war is going to drastically change, right? And as a symbol of that industrial warfare, that industrial change, and also a massive militaristic growth, this right here is the big reason why England became an ally of France instead of staying an ally with Germany, right? And it's called the naval arms race or the Anglo-German naval arms race, right? So this industrialism and warfare is going to lead to invention. It's going to lead to development. It's going to lead to all these different things. Well, a naval arms race is going to break out as well. And the Anglo-German arms race is all going to come down to who can create the most this type of boat, right? So the British in the early 1900s developed the very first 
steam-powered, iron hull style warship for the Navy, right? And a lot of this is off the outskirts of an American Commodore named Alfred T. Mahan, right? But like that is just because he said that a naval power in this post-industrial, post-imperial era is how you show your world dominance, right? So now this right here, though, is the very first one known as the HMS Dreadnought. And because that thing was such a massive development, because it could travel over very, very great distances, it had it's like like very large guns attached to it, and it could actually fire on targets that were inland. This thing became such a terrifying thing. That's why it was known as the Dreadnought, right? So as the British began to build their Dreadnoughts, Germans under Kaiser Wilhelm decided they were also going to try to build as many Dreadnoughts as they could as well. But since the Germans could not match the industrial aspects of the British, they did not unfortunately win this naval arms race, but this arms race leads to a lot of tension, right? And it leads to a great deal of anger and resentment between these two countries, and it's the reason why England went off and they actually became an alliance, in an alliance with France, rather than staying in this Teutonic People's Alliance with uh, Kaiser Wilhelm, right? So Kaiser Kaiser Wilhelm, since he couldn't build as many dreadnoughts as the English could and have these great big warships, he decided to go a different route. And he decided to stick to an old German practice of unrestricted warfare using these bad boys, right? Those are submarines. That became the German device and use in 1914, right? And whenever this war breaks out, the Germans decide to use their... Unter sie boots, right? So it would be actually be unter sie booted. All right, so now unter, unter sie boot. All right, so unter sie boot literally means U-boat, right? That's why they're called U-boats or submarines, right? They're You cannot see them. They had no sonar yet. They were unspottable. So the Germans were very deadly in the water in this perspective, right? And then also our last cause for the war, a uh, big one anyway, our big like kind of marquee cause is going to be imperialism. And then we're going to get into nationalism here in a second. But that one's kind of a little bit weird because we're talking about ethnic nationality, not so much uh, some other things. But anyway, imperialism, right? Imperialism, the thing that we spent all that time talking about is a part of this economic competition because European powers are competing for resource-providing colonies. Now, I have a very important thing to tell you. Academic kids, please pay attention to this announcement. Yeah, that's right. Pay attention to that announcement, make sure you have that written down, and be prepared for it, all right? So, now the big thing about it is, though, imperialism, what we were talking about at the very beginning of this unit, is another very large cause for this, because as a lot of these European countries are competing for these colonies, it's going to begin to draw them further and further into resentment and get them closer and closer to conflict, right? Now, nationalism is a very, very, very big reason why this war is going to break out as well, okay? Nationalism, as we know, that pride for your country, that belief in your country, country's genius is going to fuel countries to want to be the best and to be the strongest, right? So as nationalism begins to progress forward, uh, this is going to lead to a huge amount of resentment between different countries, certain countries vying and understanding and trying to advocate for others. And it's going to lead to a very, very large, crazy war when it does break out, right? So don't write this, but for example, at the outbreak of war, everyone greeted war with cheering crowds in Berlin, Vienna, and Paris. And this was written by a writer named APJ Taylor. The people of Europe leapt willingly into war. So when this war finally broke out, they actually jumped into war excitedly, right? Which is a very, very strange kind of thing to explain to kids is that like, yeah, this nationalism had boiled over so much, the industrialism and involved with militarism, and then also imperialism and the alliances are going to be so bad and so intense that these that when this war finally breaks out, everyone wanted it. It's a very creepy thing, right? Because they wanted to show how strong their country is, how powerful their country was, and how much better they thought they were than everybody else, right? Now, there's an interesting small component to this nationalism that you need to put a big star. So the next thing we're about to, put, to write down, put a big, big star next to it, because we got to talk about this duck-looking region right here. And we got to talk about what 
Pan-Slavism is, right? So this region right here is mostly made up of some of your, what you would consider Slavic countries, right? Mostly in this general region, not these people are not Slavic. So like, but these people right here are, right? So now this region in particular is going to be where the war breaks out or where it actually has its foothold and where it is created and started, right? And particularly in this area right there, that little country known as Serbia, right? So Serbia is going to be the hotbed for this, and a lot of this is because of this concept of Pan-Slavism, which is related directly to nationalism, right? Pan-Slavism is the idea or belief that all Slavic people should unify and defend one another in the creation of their own countries and their self-determination. This is going to be incited by nationalism in the late 1800s, late 1800s. And a lot of these South Slavic nations are going to be oppressed by people like Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire, right? So if we go back and look at this region right here, Austria-Hungary controlled this entire swath of territory, right? They controlled Bosnia, Croatia, and several other areas, now modern-day Slovakia. Slovenia as well. The Ottomans for a time controlled Serbia, they controlled Montenegro, Kosovo, uh, they controlled Albania, Macedonia, Bulgaria, they controlled all these major areas, right? Now, this is going to lead to this pan-Slavism aspect, and the Russians are going to enter into this war trying to advocate for these Slavic peoples, right? So going forward though, as you can see, it's a very, very weird thing going on right now, right? The Ottoman Empire, jot this down, jot this down, this is very important, put a star next to this, jot this down. The Ottoman Empire is dying, right? So it's dying out, its strength is decreasing, there's a lot of very large movements trying to go back to straight Turkish rule by this group known as the Young Turks. They want a reformation of a parliament, they want to create a different style of country focused around Turkish influence and Turkish culture, and so their borders are retreating, and they're always, they're just shrinking. Greece is going to liberate itself in 1830. Serbia, I believe, is going to liberate itself in 1816. Bulgaria is going to become an area that actually is going to be, like, available and now creating its own country lines. And so, as things rolled forward, the Ottomans were constantly trying to grab these territories back. They always wanted to pull them back into their society, pull them back into their country so they could actually keep the empire state alive. This is going to fuel a set of wars known as the Balkan Wars, right? This tension in these South Slavic states encouraged by all this nationalism is going to fuel the outbreak of a couple of small wars right before World War I itself actually breaks out. This is going to be encouraged by nationalism, and it's the fact that the Ottoman Empire was losing a lot of its Balkan states, and it's losing a lot of its Balkan power. And it's mainly going to be pushed forward by one of these states known as Serbia, right? Serbia wants to create a unified state known as Greater Serbia, right? Leading into the later kind of World War II perspective of a Yugoslavia, right? So, or actually that's post-World War I is Yugoslavia. Now, the big thing though is that this is an element of this new idea known as the powder keg, right? So, because of these Balkan wars that were breaking out, because the Serbians are getting very mad at Austria-Hungary because they annexed Bosnia, right? And we'll talk about that here in a, in a second. You could see that if this war was going to break out, it was going to break out in the Balkan territory. And so, metaphorically speaking, metaphorically, okay, as in it's not an actual thing, there's not a keg of powder and somebody could touch it, all right? So, but people and historians have began to call the Balkan states the powder keg, right? And a powder keg is a very large barrel full of gunpowder, right? And it's ready to explode at any minute. All it needs is a match, right? So basically what we've kind of cooked down to is that Austria-Hungary and its conquest or like a wanting to control and create a larger state for themselves, especially in these South Slavic regions, it's going to anger a lot of these Slavic states, especially Serbia, and also, not Bulgaria as much, but like especially Serbia and Albanians as well. And the Balkan states are going to become known as the powder keg because as movements progress and right after the Balkan Wars end, these Slavic states are trying their best to pull as many Slavic states away from people like Austria-Hungary. So everyone felt that if another war was going to break out, it was going to break out in that Balkan territory. And now that we have all these crazy intense 
things going on and all these crazy intense moments where we have this situation where there are Balkan states under the control of these people. There are Balkan states under the control of these people. And also since we have all this crazy intense stuff going on where Serbia wants to liberate other Serbs that live in Bosnia, all we need is a match, right? We need a match and we need something to go down to break this war open and for it to be created. And it is proclaimed that the match that lights this fire was started with one event. Now, notice I have started in quotes. It actually didn't break out until a month later, all right? So, like, if you ask me, that's not, never mind. We're not going to get into that right now, though, okay? So, the war itself started, quote unquote, with the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria. Now, really quick, let's get to know this man real fast so you know who he is, right? This right here is Archduke Franz Ferdinand. He's sitting right there, okay? He is the heir presumptive to the Austrian Austro-Hungarian throne, okay? That means he is next in line. His uncle, Franz Joseph, is the guy who's leading Austria at this moment, but he's an older man, he's a widower, his wife is dead, she got stabbed outside of a theater, so it's kind of one of those things that since they never had, well, they had a child named Prince Rudolf, but he died. Um, so the heir presumptive is Franz Ferdinand. Nobody really likes Franz Ferdinand, just to give you a heads up. Everybody thinks he's kind of a jerk, all right? So, because he, like, wants to bring absolutism back. He actually claimed that, like, this experiment of personal liberties is a failure, right? So, big thing about it, though, is Franz Ferdinand is the representation of the Austro-Hungarian people, right? And Bosnia had recently, as of 1907, been annexed by the Austro-Hungarian Empire following their liberation from the Ottomans, right? They liberated themselves from the Ottomans with the aid of the Serbians, and then the Austro-Hungarians went, Yow! and they just like sucked them into their empire. Well, there's a lot of Serbs that live in Bosnia, right? Because Serbs are an ethnicity, right? So, And they're ethnically Slavic, right? And so there are these Serbians and especially of this new country called Serbia, that are mad that Austria-Hungary has usurped their people and is now grabbed on to a bunch of Serbian people. So since a lot of Serbs and Slavs live in Bosnia, the Austrians are going to be viewed as oppressors, especially by these different Serbian groups, right? And an oppressor, just so you know what it is, is one who holds another one down with force, right? So... So Serbian nationalist groups are going to be created, right? These, these, I guess the best word is terrorist organization, um, a violent organization that predicates itself on bribery, assassinations, and nefarious things to get their goals accomplished are going to be formed, right? The two big ones were known as Young Bosnia and the Black Hand, right? Now, the thing about it, a lot of teachers teach this wrong, not because they don't they don't mean to do it, but it's just because there's a lot of other stuff going into this. You have to understand that a lot of teachers will always say the black hand is the one that is responsible for the assassination attempt and plan to kill Archduke Franz Ferdinand. They kind of are, but they kind of aren't, because the guys who actually did the assassinating were the young Bosnians, right? So this is the black hand. This is what young Bosnia looks right, like, right? Okay, young Bosnia was made up of a group of mostly young men, right? Mostly young men, probably most of them under the age of 21, one of them very, very famous for actually doing the deed. But here's what we need you to do. Do me a favor. Academic, we are going to discuss this assassination attempt in class, right? Honors. We're going to discuss it right now so we have an available time to talk about our book, right? So academic kids, you can go ahead and stop right here. But honors kids, let's talk about this idea, okay? So the big thing about it is young Bosnia had a 100% understanding that the Archduke had a visit to Bosnia planned for June 28th, 1914, right? Since Franz Ferdinand was going to be taking over, he thought it'd be a good idea to go on a tour of his new and upcoming empire, right? To go on a grand tour and go and visit these different places. So when he goes to Bosnia, he's planning on going to Sarajevo, all right? Sarajevo is the capital of Bosnia. It's apparently a beautiful city. Um, so, and it's spelt as follows. S-A-R-A-J-E-V-O, right? He is going to go to Sarajevo, Bosnia, their newly annexed territory, and he plans to have a parade and a big meet and greet planned for June 28th, 1914. 
highlight that date. It's important for our honors kids to know so you can see how this war actually took a little bit of time to break out. Now, this is him actually on his parade. And this is his wife, Sophie, right? So, and they're actually together on this. Now, the plan A was that six assassins are going to be getting together of the young Bosnia group because they were given weapons and goods by the Black Hand to perpetrate this assassination. These weapons included things like grenades, guns, and other monies as well, right? And the plan was is that six assassins were going to assemble on a bridge and they were going to slow the motorcade down by jumping out in front of it and being like, booga, 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 and one of the assassins, or several of them, were supposed to shoot at the car and a couple of them that had they then also had grenades, right? And so one of them was supposed to go up to, as you can see, this is a convertible, go up and dunk the grenade in the car and get out of there, and when the grenade exploded, it would kill the Archduke, his wife, and the driver, right? Now, what unfortunately happened is the guy who threw the grenade missed the car completely and actually ended up hitting people in the parade that were there to watch the parade, right? And actually injured several of them. And I don't believe anyone died in the grenade blast, but yes, yeah, several people were injured in the grenade blast, and it actually sent a lot of them to the hospital, right? And so, what an idiot. And one of these other assassins who actually shot at Franz Ferdinand, but his gun misfired, looked over, and cops were coming and descending on top of him. He was like, oh crap, oh crap, oh crap, oh crap. And he went, and he jumped off the bridge to try and go into a river, and he ate a cyanide pill to kill himself, but what happened is the cyanide pill was too weak and he just ended up throwing up everywhere and the river was only like a couple of inches deep so he ended up just splashing around in the water. And it's that's really embarrassing, all right? So now the Duke's parade is supposed to go to the hospital to visit the people that were hurt by the explosion. But after departing for the hospital, the car took a wrong turn. Just happened to take a wrong turn because the driver didn't know where he was going. And it passed in front of a coffee house where a young man named Gavrilo Princip, who was one of the six assassins who didn't get arrested, arrested, happened to escape. And he was sitting out front of a cafe, eating a sandwich and drinking a cup of coffee when they just happened to pass in front of him. How serendipitously crazy this is, is wild, right? And Gavrilo Princip, on complete happenstance in Universal, the car just happened to be right there. He stood up from his coffee, pulled a revolver out of his jacket, ran over and fired several shots into the car, killing not only the Archduke, but also his wife, right? Shot both of them at point blank range, ended up killing both of them in that moment. And this assassination is going to serve as the match that doesn't light the powder keg, but it does light the fuse that actually ends up leading to this war. So we will review that a little bit more in class. Honors kids, I hope you all enjoy the first chapter. Get to know Paul, Kemmerich. Uh, the Kemmerich story is really sad. Get to know uh, Mueller, Krop, Yadin, um, and also there's another one that's uh, like, oh, um, What's, uh, what's the other guy's name? He's the big guy. Oh, Westus. Westus is one of my favorite characters as well. Get to know these characters a little bit. So we are going to be starting our book uh, basically in the war, but we're going to be in the war as of class, okay? So I'll talk to y'all soon. Y'all have a great one.